Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name's Michael Markowski, and today we are going to be recreating another painting by another one of my all-time very favorite artists. The best artist in the during the 18th century in England. We're going to be talking about drum roll. Thomas Gainsborough. And not only are we going to be talking about Thomas Gainsborough, we are going to be talking about his most famous, most critically acclaimed painting of all time, The Blue Boy from 1770. This painting was a life-sized painting of a, you know, a young man, probably around 13 or so. And this painting at one time was the most famous painting in the entire Western world. It was a beloved treasure of England. And when it was sold to Henry Huntington, the railroad magnet uh, who is famous for building all of the, the, the transit system in Los Angeles before it was torn apart and replaced by cars... That's a whole other big story we can get into, but uh, Henry Huntington made his money from the, the Pacific Railroad in uh, Los Angeles. He bought this painting for what at the time was a record 11, in our dollars, $11 million for this painting. At one time, it was the, the, the most expensive painting on earth, and it caused a huge uproar, which led to new laws, not only in England, but across the world, for uh, to protect valuable national treasures, uh, cultural items from leaving the country. So now in England, because of this painting and a few other ones, before a painting like this can be sold at auction and and be transported from its country of origin there has to be at least an opportunity for museums and collectors within uh, England in this case to uh, try to purchase the painting before it can be sold so there's a lot of interesting stuff we could talk about in this specific painting uh, and then lots of things that branch out from that so I'm super excited to paint today's painting this is this is a bit of a challenge, so for those of you that have been anxious to get back into the Thursday paintings with me as I restarted the Intro to Painting course on Tuesdays, we have got one for you. Holy smokes, do we ever got, we got a, a big one. <laughs> so let's get right into it. Uh, what I want to do is I want to show you the... Uh, actually, before, there's a, a template, there's an outline for today's painting that is in a Dropbox folder online. So I'll show you that in a second. Uh, maybe before I go too far, I just wanna let you know there's a private Facebook group. I encourage you to join the group, upload your version of today's painting to the Facebook group. And that way we can get, you know, you can all see what you've been creating. We can share in our successes because everyone is getting better and better and better and better. And it's super exciting to see people, especially those of you who've been with me for a while, how good you have become. And I mean, I'm just super honored. I love, like, I haven't even looked at any of these posts here, um, but it looks like Shelly's doing some awesome dog portraits, super cool. Anyway, every once a month, I also go through this and give feedback on all the great art that's on that Facebook group. So stay tuned for that. Subscribe, hit the notification bell to that little bit so that way you know when those upcoming videos are happening. And whether you're painting today's painting or not, subscribe, upload your, your picture to the Facebook group. Now here's the Dropbox folder and things have maybe changed a little bit if you, if you haven't been around for a little while. At the very top of the Facebook group are all of the easiest paintings and where you find information on the first few introductory courses. So if you want to find any of the templates that exist for those, those are at the very top. As well as there's some very simple paintings which we'll be doing um, at the very top here with the letters. And then if we scroll all the way down, here we are. Here's today's painting, Thomas Gainsborough. This is where we're gonna be painted. But you can also see 
over the next few months, we're going to be looking at the most expensive paintings ever sold at auction. And all of these are all paintings by some of the world's greatest artists. These are some of the most famous paintings in human history that we're going to be tackling over the next few months. So I'm sure you'll recognize every, pretty much every one of those names. And if not, a good reason to tune in and, and paint along with me. So where are we? Uh, so these are the more complex paintings on the bottom, including today's painting. You click in the Dropbox folder, you're going to see three files. There is, of course, the outline. There's a JPEG and a PDF version, and then the original. So um, we're going to talk about Gainsborough's biography here and a little bit about the Blue Boy. There's tons of links in, every, in the description below. So if you want to check those out, uh, you can do that. But I think before I go too far down that line, I want to show you how to transfer this image. Now, I haven't had a chance to do this yet. Um, I literally five minutes ago put her daughter down for a nap. And this is usually what I do right before we begin is I'll do any tracings and film that. But I haven't had a chance. And since maybe this is the first time some of you have seen this technique, maybe it's worth just sort of doing it um, in real time. So here's a canvas that I've gessoed. Remember we talked about that in our very first episode of the intro uh, uh, to the master course series, class number one. So I gessoed this and now I'm just taking a block of 220 grit sandpaper. And I'm just gently going over the surface here. And that just takes, uh, it smooths the surface, takes out some of the, the texture, which is the whole point of putting gesso on there anyway. And just to make it a little bit smoother. Because personally, I find it's so much easier to paint on a smooth canvas than it is a canvas that is a little, has still a lot of texture on it especially when we're doing a, a painting like today, which has a has a relatively high amount of detail. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tape this image down. Now, I just printed this off. I have an inkjet printer here. I just print it off from right from the Dropbox. I literally download this from the Dropbox because uh, the computer I do this on is upstairs, so I, I, just like everybody else, I use the exact same file that's there on the Dropbox. I'm going to use some tape. There's no horizon lines that need to be straightened here. So you'll see sometimes I use a ruler just to kind of get that position. Sometimes I move it up or down, I think pretty much right in the middle. Um, I probably want a little bit more room at the, you know, once we get rid of this at the top, just so we can see a little bit more of the top of the head, because if it's framed, sometimes the shadow will sort of make it look like it's actually higher than it actually is. So we'll put that on. And then I'm going to use some carbon transfer paper. And... I'm going to use a piece of carbon transfer paper that I've used many times because I'm just I just need to get the image on here. It doesn't need to be super clear or perfect. Just as long as I can see it, that's good enough. Now you can use a pencil, you can use a pen for this. I like using just a, a red pen or pencil. That way I can see which lines I've already drawn over top of. And I'm going to do this quickly because and I'm not, I'm also not going to bother putting in every line, like maybe some of the stuff around the face, where the hair comes down, uh, where the lips are, you know, any kind of major, um, shape needs to be traced, but otherwise the majority of it we can kind of keep as is or keep un, untraced. The reason why I put so much detail into these outlines, more outline than I end up actually using is because I kind of get into it <laughs> and I'm like, oh, let's kind of, let's just, might as well make this outline as, as, as you know, uh, 
detailed as possible because maybe somebody just wants to print it out and color in it so um, which hey you could I mean or you could paint watercolor right over top of this you print it out onto you can put watercolor paper through certain printers right okay and the background I'm also just gonna very delicately outline this A lot of this background is going to get darker really quick and we're going to lose some of this detail. So I just sort of generally where these trees are going to go. Here's the sleeve. I mean, again, this painting is larger than life size. So it is, I think, 70 inches tall. Um, by I think 30 40 or so inches wide we'll take a look here as we go but it's a it's a big painting and we are painting it on a 9 by 12 sized canvas right so <laughs> it's much much smaller than the original so we aren't gonna get all of the subtle details in the face and all the fabrics my goal is to try to paint this entire painting within the next uh, about three three and a half hours so it's it's gonna be a little bit of a longer episode um, and if you're watching this long after it was recorded you can certainly just jump right to the end and then you can decide for yourself whether I did a good enough job and whether you want to come back to where we are right now and follow along interestingly enough this area right down here that I'm just tracing uh, in they've done x-rays of this painting and discovered that there was once a, a big fluffy sheepdog right here and it was painted out and we're going to talk about that because because that sheepdog was once there it has led to some more recent conversation about who this person actually is okay before I tear that tape off let's just see ah look at that i forgot to do a little bit of this hair right so that's why before i tear the tape off just want to make sure it's all there all right you could see like the details in the face for me i'm I, i'm not so concerned about making them perfect because if a lot of that is going to get lost okay i'm happy enough with this. I'm going to save my outline. <laughs> I just, I have our baby camera here just watching our daughter rolling around in bed. She got up very late this morning, didn't want to wake up, and now she doesn't want to go back to sleep. The joys of parenthood. <laughs> I love our daughter. Don't get me wrong. She's a, she is very cool. Very cool kid. We just spent the whole morning together getting really muddy, stomping, like literally covered in mud. I had to take the garden hose to hose her off. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's do what we normally do, which is to... Or at least what I normally do, which is to coat this painting with some warm yellow. Now, that's not what Thomas Gainsborough would have done. It's this is a a bit of a derivation of that same technique, because what uh, most painters would have done. It, it from this from basically over the past 600 years would have been to apply a colored ground just like we're about to do and that ground is called an imprimatura that's what the Italians who invented this technique were called or, or called it and the imprimatura is the first paint the first layer of paint I'm just putting all my colors on here if you need, if you want to know what colors I'm using, all of that information is in the video description below. And I, I've just, again, 
been doing a whole um, series of videos explaining the very, very basics of acrylic painting and all of these colors, and including, if you don't want to use this brand, um, the colors from alternate brands as well. So now I'm going to take some water and put this. This is really the only time I ever use water in my paintings. And I just realized I didn't clean this palette and there's some dried white on there. We'll see if that turns into... Sometimes, you know, once you get a little bit of water on acrylic paint, it, it won't reactivate, but you that's what we use to clean the paint. So it looks like for now I've managed to prevent that little chunks of white from flaking off but maybe I think that's that's the beginning of some of that happening so I just gotta move quick here to get as much of this paint on the canvas as possible so in that painting the first few episodes I talk about why I, I do this often like there's so many different reasons and I, I'm not going to go through all of them again because I, I sort of did, covered that in that episode but um, it's, I must have been pressing quite hard <laughs> with my pencil because these pencil lines on this painting from the carbon paper are, are pretty dark so um, this is also just going to help seal that in a little bit so that they don't smudge with the next colors now this generally, and we'll take a look in a moment here at the original, and you'll see that there is a color underneath all of the colors. That imprimatura, but it won't be this exact color. So here's some of this. These little chunks and flakes. It's a bit of a pain in the butt, but uh, sort of relatively easily dealt with here, right? This is just going to give us a nice kind of warm glow in this painting. Okay. And just like that, I just clean off my brush, rub it on the cloth. That way it's my water isn't getting contaminated too quickly. And I'm just going to clean my workspace up real quick. Okay, so I'm going to let this dry. And while that's drying, we're going to talk briefly for about five minutes about Thomas Gainsborough's biography. Lots of questions and comments there in the chat, so I'll try to get to those as quickly as possible too. So, uh, Thomas Gainsborough, born in 1727 and dies in 1788 at the age of 61, which is, you know, I guess, would it, it's probably the the average age for for a, a, a healthy individual at that time. Obviously, that would be young for our, our time. But still, there were many artists that lived longer than him, especially some of his contemporaries. Um, Sudbury, Suffolk is just east of London on the towards the coast, and, uh, you know, I think about like an hour's drive from London. And he grew up in a family that was um, sort of middle-class family his father was in the uh, in the textile industry was a uh, a weaver and created woolen goods <laughs> and you know at an, a fairly early age Thomas Gainsborough was demonstrating his his technical drawing ability enough so that his parents sent him to London to study art at that young age and at, at this time in, you know, this would have been seven, what was it, 1740? Yeah, 17, uh, where is it? I don't know if there's, I haven't read this. I've done so much other research here. I'm just, I think, oh yeah, 1740, yeah. So he leaves home at about 1742. Oh, this is not on the screen, sorry. 
Um, so <laughs> I'm just looking at the Wikipedia page here. Um, so he leaves home at the age of 13 to study uh, with Humbert Gravelot, who was a printmaker in London, although very quickly Thomas Gainsborough sort of falls under the, I guess, the spell <laughs> or, or of, of uh, William Hogarth. And William Hogarth is another great English painter of the time. Obviously, an older generation, but William Hogarth is probably... He was a great portrait artist, an incredible um, uh, printmaker as well, but really is considered by many people to be the father of of uh, the editorial cartoon and, and even potentially could be considered the father of comic books, or at least in the Western world. Uh, because he did a lot of these very these kind of genre paintings and 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 prints that were reproduced in, in newspapers at the time, so it's it's interesting when we consider that Thomas Gainsborough was studying from printmakers because a lot of the times the the job of a printmaker, you know, in this early relatively early stage of the the printing. Uh, you know the printing process had only been around for a couple hundred years, and and most of the time, print printing, when at least when it comes to art, was used to reproduce other famous artworks. It's not real. I mean, around this time, there are a few other artists who take printmaking as um, as an art medium in and of itself, and it is used to help distribute images around the world but it's often used to copy other art and to put it in books so often you know, if you were looking at, at an art history textbook at the time of when Thomas Gainsborough was young it would be full of of copies that artists like Hogarth and Gravelot and even Gainsborough himself would have done of other famous paintings because the technology didn't exist to take a photograph of let's say the Mona Lisa and then print it in a book, someone would have to draw it, and that would be what we would, would have seen, right? So I find that stuff very fascinating because there is that little area of interpretation where maybe, you know, we just sort of have to take it for granted that the, the print looks like the original, and because unless you actually go to the other country, which could be quite far away and quite costly, tourism is just beginning as a concept. You just have to take it for granted that the printmaker did their job really well. Anyway, long story short, let's continue on here. Um, by the age of 25, he's married, he has two children, and he's very quickly establishing himself as one of the preeminent portrait artists in England. And he is getting commissions from the most wealthy, most powerful people in England, including the king and the queen of England. And, you know, there's... He becomes the, the favorite painter of the king. We'll, and we'll come back to that in a second here because that's a, an interesting kind of uh, relationship. Um, and because of this, of his popularity and his recognition, he's invited to become one of the founding members of what becomes known as the Royal Academy. And a lot of other European nations at this time have also these academies of art. And the academies are these become these very powerful institutions, really the gatekeepers of what art is within each individual country, right? There's the famous academies in France that the Impressionists later rebel against. Uh, here in England, the academy is, you know, if you basically the, the only way art was exhibited during this period is you would submit your painting to the academy and they would judge it. And if they believed it was of, of, um, of high enough quality and 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 upheld various principles that they had literally printed out, then you would be accepted to exhibit your work. Usually once a year. Sometimes they'd have like a summer and a fall or winter exhibition, and those 
and then th that's the people would come and see it and and those exhibitions were hung salon style literally paintings all up on top of one another all the way up to including sometimes even the ceiling and we're talking you know like your high school gymnasium type of space like airplane hangers full of paintings all the way up to the top and literally you'd, you'd somebody we sitting there with little binoculars on a stick looking oh yes that's a beautiful painting oh yes oh i like that one the third one from the top on the ceiling there it's just crazy that that's how art was exhibited can you imagine having your painting like like the up at the ceiling they'd be they'd be, they'd be on an angle right like you might have your painting up there at the very top you know and people are way down below and they're trying to <laughs> anyway so that was the state of affairs at the time and Gainsborough is invited to become one of the founding members of the new Royal Academy in England and he participates in the Academy he shows with them but Gainsborough is a bit of um, yeah, a bit of a uh, he has a kind of a revolutionary kind of a spirit and he has many disagreements with the academy including the man who would feature prominently in his life going forward sir joshua reynolds and sir joshua reynolds becomes really the most powerful person within the the english art world at this time and is the president of the royal academy and later on when the the sort of official portrait painter of the king dies even though Gainsborough was the king's favorite that position you know was sort of reserved for the president of the academy and that went to his bitter enemy sir joshua reynolds which i'm sure did not go over very well right and i'm sure joshua reynolds probably relished that mm, i love it oh my enemy isn't allowed but of course still the king would invite gainsborough to come and and do the occasional sort of portrait on the side or just have tea etc right um what else do i want to mention you know it's interesting that gainsborough is this is this is his most famous painting the blue boy and yet he was not a particularly satisfied doing portraits i think he talks somewhere about it's probably in here about his really his desire is to retire from the big city london and get away from all the politics and all of these these he, he 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 talks very colorful about the the wealthy people who were his clientele is sort of just being the only thing that's that's worth looking at i think he, the quote is the only thing worth looking at about these people is their purses their hearts are empty I'm sort of paraphrasing but oh i, I think it's right here <laughs> um yeah the only thing that the, worth looking at is their purse their hearts are seldom near enough the right place to get a sight of it right um so their hearts are hidden they're they're just void of anything you know which is you maybe things haven't changed in five three hundred years right um what else do i want to mention maybe we'll get to some of the other stuff with later on his biography anything else uh, we'll talk about his technique but we'll talk about his technique as we start painting this painting because again it is it's quite different I mean, if for, you know, for our purpose, it's going to be very, the, it, it won't be too different than many things we've done before, but if we were to compare his paintings and his approach to Joshua Reynolds, we would probably see how they were different. At the time, they would have seen radically different. They would have been, the two, the two were on very, very different tracks on how to make a painting, but let's talk about that as we get going here. This painting is almost dry so i'm just going to hit it actually maybe just so we just wipe off some of this at the top there it's, it's going to get covered with paint in a moment anyway okay so let's take a look at the original here <laughs> gail says hi everybody today's one's going to be a tough one um paula says michael you forgot your blue painting shirt I'm 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 gonna wear this sweater from now on, or at least for the next little while, um, especially because it was. Now it's getting a little hotter in my studio. But, um, 
Uh, anyway, it's also kind of a nice, it kind of reflects a little bit of light as opposed to my belly absorbing all of the reflected light, so I get a little bit of light coming back from this area. Anyway, I appreciate the comments there. Color you said, when will we do another episode reviewing people's paintings? Uh, I, I, think, I can't remember the schedule. It's either next weekend or the weekend after, so I'll take a look at that. But again, subscribe to the Facebook group and you shall, all will be revealed, right? <laughs> Okay, so let's do a little bit of detective work on this painting. One of the really in okay, if we go just what, back to what I was saying before about Sir Joshua Reynolds, many people consider this painting to be a sort of rebuttal to uh, Reynolds, in that Reynolds, his approach to painting was very, very. Um, formal, very academic. He was the head of the academy for... <laughs> uh, but uh, really applying very classic principles of painting, many of which we use in these paintings, right? And Joshua Reynolds was pretty adamant that if you're going to use a cool blue, it must be in the background. No ifs, ands, or buts. And if you're going to put it anywhere in the foreground, you got to do it very delicately, just a little highlight or two. His rival, Thomas Gainsborough, says, Hold my drink. <laughs> you, you say we can't make a painting with a cold blue in the foreground. Ha! <laughs> really? Okay. This is what he does in response. Now, again, that's sort of the, the, the myth that has come down to us from history, that this is the official response to, to Reynolds. The, the quote of Reynolds talking about the blues being cold blues only in the background was actually written eight years after this painting was made. But I, I, I'm pretty sure that Gainsborough would have been aware of Reynolds and because it's not like Reynolds just came up with that. That would have been something he would have been talking about and writing about you know, them when they would have gotten together, because there would be these banquets of all the members of the Academy, uh, and they would have probably had some pretty fierce arguments about some of these ideas. So this, in, at the very end of the day, I think this still, that 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 idea of, of Gainsborough sort of using this painting to, to directly confront one of Reynolds' primary... Um, uh, one of his primary technical gold standards, I think, is as still holds up here. So, what we're looking at is this boy who is painted with a lot of cool blues right in the foreground. And that, you know, in, I think, is it next week, we're going to be talking about warm and cool colors for our beginners class. And one might say this is breaking the cardinal rule of warm and cool colors. And yet, Gainsborough manages to pull it off, and it becomes the most successful painting in the Western world. How did he do that? What is, what's going on in this painting that both breaks the rules and yet upholds the rules, right? Um, and... That means it's this painting is gonna, you know, is, has some challenges for us, but I don't see it as being anything that is impossible for us to overcome. Um, so I think we'll come back to how we, we're gonna deal with the these cool colors in the foreground, but let's just sort of take a quick look. I just want to see if we could see any of the imprematura here. So what I think we we're looking at down here in these browns, I'm pretty sure that would have been the foundational color on this painting. Some of this really orangey reddish brown down there, that would have been what I have, what he would have done in lieu of this warm yellow that I painted, right? So we're, we're gonna paint this color here. Um, again, I just put this warm yellow because it's nice and quick, we get it onto the canvas. Um, that's the first thing that I'm looking that I at least just want to show. I think one of the ways that Gainsborough sort of gets away with this cool color, very intense cool color, like not very diluted either, is 
almost the rest of the painting is also painted with very cool colors. So he's not, he's still using the warm and cool color uh, approach. He's just not putting a lot of warm colors in the painting, especially not in the background because you wouldn't want to do that anyway. But even in the foreground, I mean, he's got a bit of this down here but it's, it's kind of muted. There's some uh, greens and darker colors sort of overlapping it. And of course, he the, the under color is also warm as well, right? So uh, let's think about where we should begin on this painting here. I think, I think what I want to do is I'm gonna mix a a cool a darker cool blue that I want to put in the background and then we're gonna glaze a little bit over top of it with this kind of brown so let's get right started uh, I'm gonna go to a smaller brush this big brush we'll just move to the side even though I used it I'm gonna wash it again later on so Nope, I want... Come on. Okay. So to get this color up here, because I'm going to start in the background, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my cool blue. Actually, I'm going to take a bunch of it, because we're going to need a lot of this color. Uh, I'm going to take a bit of cool yellow. I'm going to take a, a little bit of warm red. Not a lot. I don't want to make a black. I just want to darken this color. So by putting that warm... I mean, basically what I've done here, this combination of colors is the same combination that I would use to make our black. But I'm just not using the same ratios of color. I just want something that's going to be kind of a dark blue. But not the darkest color that I can make. In fact, let me give it just a bit more of a, a greenish quality here. And let's just look at this original here. I think that's pretty good. I'm also just going to add a little bit of... Oh, right here. I'm just going to put a bit of matte medium in here just to thin it out just a little bit. I don't want to get rid of the, the yellow completely. All right, so this is going to make this color just a little bit more transparent if you don't have matte medium you could use your glazing fluid uh, you could use slow dry medium if you have it if if you really didn't have anything you could try using Mod Podge All right, you could use some Mod Podge. Probably not recommended because Mod Podge, I don't really know. I haven't, I've never really investigated it, but I don't imagine Mod Podge is the best thing for like the a long term health of a painting. I think it's more formulated for kind of craft purposes. But I think it could work if you just if you're just looking around your house and you're like, oh, I don't have that. Okay. So, let's just take a look at the original here.
little bit of white in here for these clouds. like there's I want to get a little bit of this red horizon in there so I'm going to keep that kind of light maybe I'll just put this in and just wipe that gently away just to get that stained a bit but not too dark also take this color we could do it in the trees but I think I might just use a slightly lighter version of that for the trees um, I'm gonna use this just down here I'm gonna paint over it with a, something a little bit warmer So that's the beginning. Um, let's just... Actually, maybe while I'm right here, what I'm just going to do is take the same color, mix it into my cold blue a little bit, and we're just going to paint in some of these trees. So you can see we're sort of getting some a different kind of color here. Very subtle. I, I'm not sure how well that shows up on camera, but so it's just got a little bit. It almost looks a little bit more green in a way, even though I put a little bit more blue in it because obviously we have this yellow that's popping through here. Um, I'm just gonna take a little bit of white. A bit of this white. Maybe make that go a little bit more gray. I should have maybe put a bit of. I don't like how. You know what? That's a little bit too intense. It's going to take a bit of matte medium mix that into here just so it's not quite as dark. Actually, I'm going to take a bit more warm red. Oops. Warm blue. Just to make it go a bit more gray. Next, I'm going to mix the color down here. So, I think what I'm going to do, uh, because I think this is what he was doing, 
is I'm gonna mix a cool brown. So I'm gonna, it's rather, usually I, I mix a warm brown. But again, because the, he's using this very cool blue right in the foreground, in order, I don't want this to come in front of his body. So I'm gonna use a bit of a cooler yellow. Or a cooler brown, I mean. So I'm gonna take my warm red and, or sorry, I'm taking my cool red and cool yellow, mixing this together. I'm gonna take just a little bit of this blue. So we've got a cooler color. Maybe I'll just put a little bit of matte medium in here. Just to thin this out. So I'm just gonna make a bit more of it. So what I did is by adding this color here, the blue, that cold blue, just sort of brings it back from an orange to a brown, right? So let's just take this. And then we're gonna put some of that in the sky here in a moment as well. I'm just gonna, I need to blow dry all of that. And there's just a little bit in between his legs here. Okay, just soften. That's pretty good for our initial layer of the background. Right, the color it's, it's the colors look kind of pretty strong. We're gonna layer another layer of color over top, which is gonna give it a little bit more subtlety. Um, I'm, at this moment, I'm just thinking to myself, should I finish the, this background or do the foreground? and then come back and add this color on here. Uh, it doesn't really matter too much, except that I don't wanna to lose too much of this detail. So what I think I might do actually is try to mix a bit of a darker color for myself that I can use to do some outlines. So I'm gonna take my warm red and the same color Actually, there's a bit of white in there, which is... Or oh, maybe there's just... Maybe there isn't white. Maybe it's just... So this is my cool blue, cool yellow, and warm red together. And these together will mix like our darkest dark. There's a bit of white in here, which is just making it go a little bit gray. I, oh, you know what it is? It's the matte medium. That's why it's sort of, okay. But either way, 
the the main thing I'm mixing this for is I just want to be able to get something dark that I can use to go over top of my my lines here oops <laughs> right now I'm, yes I might lose a little bit of these details in the figure but I've never really been I, I, I really strongly discourage you from becoming like a slave to your to your outlines that way you're it's just going to slow you right down. The outlines are there just to kind of help get the painting started. And get the composition in place. They're not there to for you just to kind of paint by numbers, right? So this just gives us an idea of where everything goes. I'm just gonna take this color. This is gonna be a, a kind of a much darker color later. So I might as well just paint it out. In fact, I actually kind of like that color. We can use that same color for some of this shadowy stuff too. Now that I see how it's developing. But we'll reserve that for that moment here as we get going. So, oh, our daughter finally went to sleep. Yesterday, I put her down to bed at 2.30. She didn't fall asleep till 4. And then I had to get her up at like 5.30. So, uh, didn't get much sleep last night. Or yesterday afternoon. Okay, all these spam in here. Um, okay. Still a little bit wet, so let, I'm just gonna blow dry this here, and then that way I can now. I think I'm gonna paint on the the body, and then we'll we'll go back to the background. We'll finish the background, then we'll finish the blue boy. Okay, so one second. So mute the microphone. Okay, maybe it's worth just also looking at a few little bits of info here on the painting itself. Um, 
So this painting exists as part of the Huntington Museum and Library collection. Uh, do I have, oh, I didn't open, oh yeah, here's their website. The Huntington Museum is a great museum, probably a very forgotten museum in the United States. Even people in Los Angeles may not be familiar with it. If you grew up in Los Angeles, you probably went to the Huntington Museum on a field trip. When I lived in Los Angeles for 12 years, it uh, it's just sort of just, it was near where I used to live in Pasadena and San Marino is sort of the next little, there's Pasadena, South Pasadena, and then San Marino. And it's this gigantic uh, estate that uh, looks, it has, it's sort of modeled after a great European, like Versailles, like kind of place, right? Henry Huntington, who was this very wealthy man that made his money uh, by selling real estate and building train lines, the, the Pacific rail cars, which used to crisscross all around Los Angeles. And he made a fortune doing that. And in fact, he had his own train line that would go from downtown Los Angeles right to his front door, right? That's when you, if you own your own train line, why not, right? Just as an aside, I'm, I find all this really fascinating is that I, I, I lived for 12 years in Los Angeles and you'd hear from people all the time like, oh, LA is this horrible place to drive. And it's how ironic because it was built around the car. That's not true. Los Angeles was built around the transit lines. Los Angeles at one point had the world's greatest transit system. It's hard to believe today, but at one point Los Angeles had incredible public transit. And one of the ways Huntington made a lot of his money is he would buy these far off, these properties that, that were out, you know, an hour's drive outside of Los Angeles. And he'd just buy it for pennies on the dollar. And, and people would be like, why would you want to, this isn't the bits just dust and, and there's nothing here. And, he'd, and then a few years later, he would put an extension to his train line to go all the way out to this once, you know, vacant area in the middle of the desert. And then all of a sudden that property, now there's a train line and anybody can get there within a half an hour. It all of a sudden becomes a very expensive property, right? Um, and what ha happened to the transit lines that's a whole other great question or that's a great story there's a whole i'm as you can there's lots of conspiracies about that it's not really a conspiracy at all though it sounds like a conspiracy uh, anyway let's just talk briefly about this painting at the huntington collection uh, henry huntington had a great art collection he was also into collecting books and old manuscripts they have one of the uh, copies of the Gutenberg Bible, if I remember in the collection. All these r incredible little artifacts and a great gardens. They're awesome, 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 cool gardens, plants from all over the world. Why was I looking at that? I wanted to, I guess, show the size of this painting. So I was right, 70 inches by 44 inches, which just as a quick reminder is, is a little bit smaller, a little, little bit shorter than a piece of plywood. Right. If you think of like my table here is a piece of three quarter inch plywood, right? Which is, you know, 40, is it 48 by 96 inches? So 48 inches, you could barely put your arms around it, right? You're like, <laughs> right? And 70 inches is a little maybe just above my head here right so it's the, that this is a big big painting uh what else do i want to show maybe that's let's let's think that's that's good <laughs> so let's uh let's think about how we're gonna put this color in the background so what i, I think i want to do because this brown is starting to kind of seize up. I think I'm going to actually paint a little, I'm going to glaze with this brown. I just want to make sure my, okay, my microphone was off. That is so interesting. Deborah says, on another note, af Michael, after World War II, it seemed like all new wives seemed to get a copy of the Blue Boy as like a wedding present. Rick's mom had a print, so did my mom, and my mom did a needlepoint of him. 
Uh, and did you see Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Who Framed Roger Rabbit? It's all about the conspiracy of the trolley system in Los Angeles. Yes, I was going to mention that. Yes. Um, I, that's an. I I don't know that. I've never heard that story about the um, about people being gifted the blue boy or doing needlepoint of it. I mean, again, the or maybe I haven't mentioned it, but the Blue Boy painting was the most famous painting in the Western world for all of the 1800s, right? And we think of now the Mona Lisa as being the most famous painting on Earth. The Mona Lisa really, you know, it was well known to some extent, but ironically enough, it wasn't until the Mona Lisa was stolen in, I think, 1911, 1912, around there. And Picasso was one of the artists that was suspected of having stolen the Mona Lisa and was arrested and, you know, interrogated quite intensely. It was a very traumatic part in, in his life and led to the breakup of him and his friendship with Apollinaire. I've told that story before. But and that's that story is recounted really, really well, very colorfully in Norman Mailer's book, uh, Picasso as a, the a portrait of Picasso as a young man. Great book, even if you don't like Norman Mailer, highly recommended. Um, but the Mona Lisa wasn't really famous until it was stolen, and that, that was what sort of catapulted it into its fame. Prior to that, prior to the Mona Lisa being stolen, if you had asked anyone especially in the English-speaking world, what is the most famous painting? This would have been the painting that would have immediately jumped to everyone's mind, no matter what class you know that you were from, because you would have seen this image reproduced in, in newspapers, posters, needlepoint, like everywhere you would have gone, you would have seen this image. And so you can imagine, just imagine if the French sold the Mona Lisa to, in, in today's world, let's say if it was sold to a, like a Japanese or Chinese billionaire, right? That would probably give you an idea of how the English people at the time felt when the Blue Boy was sold to an American billionaire, right? People like just could not believe it. And if you think it's impossible for a museum to sell their artwork, that is one of the major controversies that's brewing in the art world right now because there's a lot of museums that are struggling and there's been a lot of museums that have been selling their collections, selling some of the famous Monet's and Renoir paintings that maybe aren't on display but might be in storage or maybe even on display because there's a few times that's happened over the past few years and people are have lost their minds about it understandably so because some people when they're donating a painting to a museum they're expecting it to be there for till the end of time not being sold to pay off the debts sometimes not even related to the museum but as part of a university etc anyway obviously i've got myself into these tangents <laughs> um let's go to a i'm gonna go to a slightly smaller brush here so what I want to do now is I'm going to try to get up into this brown here. Uh, oh, you know what? I wanted to get that white first. So maybe even bef before I do that, I just want to get a little bit more. Let's get some white on here. Probably should have added a little bit of glazing fluid to this to make it a little bit thinner. Because now that's pretty intense. So maybe I'll just see if I can just wipe a little bit of this paint off a little bit just to. So I'm going to need to blow dry that just briefly because I want to glaze over top of it. 
Okay, so just bear with me. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm gonna take my glazing fluid, I'm gonna get it all over my brush here, and I'm just gonna take some of this brown. I'm gonna take just a bit more yellow. Hmm, just need to go a little bit, a little bit more opaque. A little, I just need to add more pigment to it. Even more, right? It's good to start out slow here when you're using glazing fluid because the whole point is to kind of make thin layers of paint. And if you just launch right in with some thick paint, it sort of just defeats the whole purpose of putting um, glazing fluid. You could do this with matte medium if you absolutely had to. The one difference of using glazing fluid is that it uh, uh, has a, it'll take just an extra few minutes to dry and generally that's appreciated. I'm just going to glaze So again, he's pushing this kind of cold brown color over top of already a fairly cool sky. And that's just helping to continue to push, 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 push the colors further backwards. Right? I do suspect, I feel like maybe I could have done a second coat of that uh, blue. Let me take this. Actually, I'm gonna let's do the opposite. I'm gonna glaze down here with the color we used for the uh, the outlining on the figure. So, put some of my glazing fluid here. See how dark it became. Okay, and this whole darker area right in behind here. Now this is very, very subtle. We, we're gonna amp all of this up as we go, but f just to kind of get started. In fact, I should have painted that the same white here. So, you know what, let's see if I can get away with my brown. Here's just the collar. So this is the white. There's a little bit of a brown in there. Okay. 
You can just do his hand just a tiny bit there. In fact, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that just gently on his face, just to keep that consistent. Okay. Um, you know what? I'm gonna. I'm not satisfied with how much yellow is showing through here, so I'm gonna. I need to blow dry that, but I think I'm gonna do a very light glaze with my blue. So this ends up being an extra little step that I that I've created for myself. But you know, I'm trying to figure it out in real time. So there's gonna be a few of these sort of back and forth where I'm gonna get it exactly right the first time. So it's gonna mute. Okay, so I'm going to take this dark blue, I'm going to glaze a little bit with it. The same blue we put in the sky, I'm just going to take it, that glazing food's going to make it a little bit more transparent. There we go. So let's just see. Oops, we want this view. So it's, it's sort of hiding a little bit like 70 percent of of the color that was there not all of it we don't want it or at least i don't want it to completely disappear it's just about sort of darkening it down just a little bit maybe just very gently doing this area So that, that top is where it needs to be most dark. Maybe a little bit more down here. Maybe while that's drying, let's do a little bit more of a, this darker brown. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna because I want to put that dark brown up here. So let's. I'm just gonna blow dry that whole thing. Uh, it's interesting. Carol says, I had Blue Boy and Pinky in beautiful oval frames since 1967. It's worth mentioning that Pinky uh, Huntington is also at the Huntington Library. And I'll just show you. Um, 
So the painting that Carol's just talking about, Pinky, is another... The, the, these two paintings are often hung or have been hung side by side or across from one another at the Huntington Museum again where the Blue Boy is. The Blue Boy is on its way. It's probably in London right now because for the first time in 100 years since it was purchased by Henry Huntington, it's back on display at the National Gallery in London, England for I think three or four months. So if you live in that part of the world, this is probably the last time that this painting will ever travel again. So, and you, I think they're also exhibiting it alongside of some other Gainsborough's paintings and some of the paintings that inspired Gainsborough, uh, the Anthony Van Dyke paintings. And Anthony Van Dyke was a, I think he was a Dutch painter who, who ended up moving to England in the latter half of his life and became sort of the, the, the court painter for the King of England. And his style was also very loose. And, and the looseness of Van Dyck's style was very influential to uh, Thomas Gainsborough and, and, and was one of the, the rifts between him and, and Sir Joshua Reynolds because um, we haven't talked about Thomas Gainsborough's style yet. So Thomas Gainsborough's style is a very loose, uh, very, you know, um, brushy kind of style. We don't, can't really see it too much in this painting. Cause again, this painting is life size, right? So if you're standing next to this painting, your head is roughly the same size as this boy's head, which is a little bit unusual. Well, I wouldn't say super unusual, but it is, you know, most of the time when people draw portraits, they're usually a little bit smaller, if not half size, right? So to do a full length, life size portrait of someone is generally reserved for someone who's fairly wealthy. There is some major disagreement as to who the blue boy actually was. It for a long time was believed to be, um, I'm trying to remember the name of this fellow. I'm sure, well, we could see right here. Um, it was believed to be a portrait of Jonathan Buttall. Um, Jonathan Buttall. <laughs> uh, and because Jonathan Buttall <laughs> had this painting as part of his collection for decades until he ran into some financial difficulties and sold it. So, uh, but many people believe it's actually one of Thomas Gainsborough's, I think, nephews? Because when we remember we talked about how there was a a dog, there was an X-ray. So in the bottom right corner of this painting, there was a fluffy sheepdog here. And I'm trying to look at it. I think when I looked at the X-rays before, it sort of seemed to line up with these rocks as being like the feet of the dog and the face somewhere here. Now obviously he's done a really good job of disguising it because we didn't know it was there until it was X-rayed. But it turns out the the dog belonged to the Gainsborough family and you know it's while it's possible that this Jonathan Butthall came over and um, uh, had his portrait painted next to the painters or the painters family's dog you usually would have been if you're gonna get your portrait painted you would bring your own animal and if you didn't have an animal you probably wouldn't include it unless it was part of like your your family's crest or it had some sort of special significance uh, anyway so that's why a lot of people now dispute the fact that it was Jonathan Buttall and instead one of the Gainsborough family uh, children <laughs> so, uh, so anyway I just wanted to show you know it's hard to really see in this picture but you know even like these highlights on the arm where he's put these brush strokes they're not very carefully painted and modeled in. Like when we think of like the Mona Lisa and brush strokes, which are very, you know, almost disguised. Like it just looks like it was heaven sent. Oh, boom, painting appears, right? Because you can't even see a single brush stroke on there. That was, that was Leonardo da Vinci's approach to painting, or, or at least on the Mona Lisa, right? Because that's all it, but 
Leonardo and a number of those other Renaissance painters tried to kind of create, you know, the sfumato, right? This technique, which is the super smooth transition from one color to another. That is not what Gainsborough is doing here. We can see almost every brush stroke in this painting. Really, the only place where we don't see a lot of that, and again, excuse, it's, I'm sorry that's a little pixelated, but this is the highest resolution image I could find. The, the only place where we don't see the brush strokes quite so visibly is in the face, which is also not uncommon. Generally, people, artists would work the face a little bit more, but as Gainsborough sort of continues throughout his life, he becomes looser when he paints faces as well. And we see that that's sort of the, hist the, the story of modern art, where artists started being like, you know what, it's, why don't we just treat the face exactly the way we treat the body? And if we're gonna paint the clothes very loosely, let's just paint the face loosely too, right? Anyway, so uh, I wanted to glaze this background again. So let's look at this. I'm gonna put some of my glazing fluid in here. And our brown, I think we'll, we'll, we can just use this brown as is for right now. Maybe a little bit more yellow in there, cool yellow. Again, all, you can see just by the colors I'm using here, I haven't even touched my warm yellow, haven't even touched my warm blue, and I've just used a little bit of warm red. So all of the colors, maybe it's easier if I turn it like this, all of the colors we've been using have been our cool colors in this painting, including the browns. So this is very different than what we normally do because often when we're painting our browns, we're using our, a warmer color for those areas. So, the, the benefit of doing, a, of glazing is that we can really build up very carefully, super subtle, great variations in color. And we can use our a mop brush, as it's called, to kind of softly blend those areas out. Now, when it comes to this painting, we're not gonna do too much blending, except maybe in the face, but the face is so small that there's gonna be very little room for doing that anyway. Um, let me see, maybe a bit down here. So I'll probably do at least one more layer up there in the sky, and it looks like I'm just gonna also make that go a little, a little darker. Actually, this looks like it could just go more brown again as well. Okay, and I, so I think that I'm, I've been kind of a little bit uh, timid with the way I've applied my glazing fluid here. I think the next one I'll just go, you know, five steps faster or further. So I want to come back down here and I want to glaze again. I'm gonna take my, again my, I'm gonna mix this a little bit more. I'm mixing another brown. This one's just gonna be a much darker brown. So I took my cool yellow, cool red, and I'm gonna take my, that was, oops, there's a little bit of warm blue. Not so bad because this is in the foreground, but I want to keep some of these warmer colors to a minimum in this painting. Did I put glazing fluid in there already? If not, I'll just put a little bit more. Okay. Now ideally I would have, I would be doing a lot more work on some of these flowers and everything before I start glazing and just feeling the, the pressure of time to kind of just 
you know, get more of this painting painted in as quickly as possible. But I think, you know, should just, just a bit of an introduction to his technique. use this to get sort of the bottoms of these trees down there okay I think that's you know what I'm just gonna let some of this dry here and I want to start tackling the main body because one of the things that um, I always think about is I don't want to just finish one area of the painting and try to you know like literally try to get it all done I'm just going to finish that whole puzzle piece and move on to the next puzzle piece and solve that area. Because what often happens is you get one area, you might feel like it's perfect, and then you do the other area and it throws the sort of perfect area out of whack. So I always want to try to do, you know, an, enough in one area to kind of get it started and then flip backwards, come back, or, or just move on to another area and then we can kind of come back and forth, right? So let's get this cool blue in here. Maybe even before I jump into that. No, we'll do the skin tones and hair. We'll do that afterwards. Let's get this blue in here. So I don't know where I should put it. I think. Um, I'm going to put it right here. This is a, this is a challenge. Um, okay. I'm thinking... I'm, so I'm not exactly sure the best way to do this because we're talking about the greatest, you know, probably in, in terms of all time history, maybe the top in the Thomas Gaines or we would be indisputably within the top five of the greatest English painters, you know, the country of England painters of all time. And this is his best painting. And it's the painting where he's challenging this whole warm and cool color process to to basically throw mud in his arch rival's face. So we're, I mean, <laughs> I'm just like, okay, um, what's the best way to go about this? It's entirely possible. I, I think we're, gonna, I think I've got a good idea of how he's doing it. But so let's. We're, I'm taking my cool blue. I'm adding a bit of. Um, uh, matte medium in here just to thin it out make it a tiny bit more transparent because if you look at the chest here do you see how there's there there's a, a level of transparency in here that I don't think is too far off the color that we also have in here so what I'm my thinking is to put a, a layer of cold blue uh, unalterated with unalter uh, whatever uh, without any extra material in it, any with the no value change or whatever, and just paint this over top, and let's just see what we get. Obviously, it's because it, it, I've made it a little bit thinner with the matte medium. It's going to go a bit green rather than blue, but that's okay. And then in subsequent layers, we will. adds a little bit more value to it. Now again, the original, he probably would have painted a, a warm brown in here rather than this yellow, so it wouldn't be quite so, you know, uh, electric blue here. 
that's just kind of a, an aspect of my own approach to painting that I've been exploring over this past couple of years. I think the shoes... They've got a bit of brown in there as well. Different, different brown. Okay. You know what, I'm just gonna put a bit more of this just in a few spots on these trees. What happens if I paint this over these socks too? Okay, I'm gonna let this dry. Actually, I'll probably blow dry it, and then I think I might do it one more time and just see what what we can get from here. Carol says, you'll do justice to it, Michael. You always do. And Pascal says, no pressure. Okay, so I think I'm going to take a bit of white. In fact, I'm going to take a bit of my gray. Not not too much of it, but a little bit of my... I'm just going to add a little bit of gray. That white is going to make it a little bit more opaque. And I'm going to try doing this again. So you, you can also see why I, I paint those uh, pencil lines with my dark color so that I can see this work that I'm doing. Otherwise, you, you know, just all those pencil lines would be, for my outlines, would have been obliterated by this point, right? coming through so I think it's that and then another layer of this this cool blue and as I'm looking at it it looks to me I can see oh, where am I here? that it's it's there's also this is not just a cool blue, but we we also have a little bit of warm blue starting to be introduced into some of the darker areas. I, kn I knew it was there, but now that I'm seeing the results of what a cool blue looks like, this is, he's very clever in this painting. Like, I mean, I, I this none of this surprises me, but it's one of these things when you actually start trying to do it yourself, you're like, oh, wow, like that's... That's some next level workmanship involved in here. So just want to get these shoes a little bit brown. Um, 
Carol says, I find it amazing how well a yellow background works no matter the palette. Isn't that kind of crazy? I mean, that's one of the same things that I've felt like if you had asked me a couple of years ago about putting a yellow background like this, I mean, I used to do this when I was just painting in my beginner painting classes, just as a quick way to help total beginners sort of color the background. Um, and it worked pretty well. It was like, oh, okay, that it, it instantly creates an effect and no one has to learn how to mix any colors to, in order to do it. And sorry, I was just painting a little bit of the hair there. It was just driving me crazy. Speaking of the yellow. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, it works. But I mean, surely it won't work for every painting. I mean, this is just like a quick and dirty little technique just to kind of get a beginner painter off the ground. And then I started doing them in these episodes, and it was kind of like, whoa, it still works. Like, I mean, it's just a more uh, higher intensity color than a brown. So the, the chroma level is more intense, so it gives a bit more of a glowing effect. But we can kind of counteract it, or we can use it in every other situation on top of it. Yeah, it's it, it blows my mind as well, Carol. I appreciate you pointing, you reminding me though, because it's just sometimes it's, it, color is this. I, we talked about it just the other day. There's a magical quality to it that you some you're you can't you don't really know what it's going to do until you do it. Right? You can sit there an armchair quarterback all you want. You're like, nah, I don't think those color combinations are going to work. And then you do it, and it's like, whoa, actually it does kind of work. Um, okay. So, oops, let's, we want this view here. Side by side. Yeah, you can see, like, on its own, when I just look at this painting, it's like, wow, those are really cool blues. And then I look next to here where we have some really cool cyan, and you're like, oh, in comparison, all of this starts to look like ultramarine blue. And I think there's, there, I, we still have cool colors in the original, don't get me wrong, but I think he's just very cleverly using all cool colors elsewhere around it to make what is you know maybe a a lukewarm blue appear much much colder because if this was surrounded by cold cold colors then this would look much warmer uh, than than he would have wanted it to be very very smart guy this fella huh right <laughs> okay so uh, let's I'm gonna come back into the background. I just want to get that taken care of completely before I move on. Um, there is also little touches in the trees, but um, so let's see. I'm going to need a bit more cool yellow. So I'm just going to mix this brown again. Cool yellow and cool red. I'll lean a little higher on the yellow. Okay, let's just take a bit of, so let's take some cool blue. bit of glazing fluid in here. And we'll, in fact, I'm going to put a bit more just because if I want to blend this out, the glazing fluid is super helpful for that. Alright, that's you know, as I said, I was going to go much bolder just because I just, times, in terms of time. If I was him, I would just be doing many layers of this and taking my time. And we would get maybe a little bit nicer level of 
I mean, even that is uh, drives me a little bit. Not quite as just a little bit. Anyway, let's just keep on going. Otherwise, I'll just be sitting here working on the background all afternoon. And... bad again not quite as subtle as I would normally as I would ideally like it to be but we're kind of in the ballpark here and I'm just gonna go over this area just a little bit okay now let's go down here this is our other dark color. I mean, I could even, I mean, it's interesting, like there's little areas where I feel like I could do more of it, you know, areas where, I, I mean, I could also go back with the blue and, and I might even do that actually. Now that I look at it, I could see doing a bit of that in a few places and adding more. So it's, it's sort of give and take, right? <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, I think let's mix a flesh tone and let's start dealing with the face and then I think we'll, we'll deal I think basically what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to move on to to painting the the body and if we want if we have time at the end I'll I'll tackle the the background a little bit more but I think for our purpose it's probably probably mostly good right okay so let's mix a flesh tone here so I'm going to take um, some warm yellow I'm going to take some warm red. I'm going to make an orange, even a little bit lighter. I'm going to take some white and a little bit of warm blue, not too much, right? Now there's no such thing as like a, a generic flesh tone. I mean, we mixed a kind of a version yesterday just to sort of show people the kind of quick and dirty way of sort of just getting something there. But every flesh tone is gonna look a little bit different depending on how the light is hitting it, etc. So let's just zoom right on in, go right to this face here. And just think about the color that we want here. So up top, Usually, there's sort of like three zones in a face. At the top here, we've got kind of, it's usually a little bit lighter. And then we got a bit more of a, you know, a slightly warmer where we've got all the kind of the, the blush on the face. 
and then much cooler, almost sometimes a little bit more purpley down here. So we're going to probably see a little bit of kind of almost some greens in here, and warmer colors. So on the top, uh, in fact, let's, let's zoom in. So far zoomed in because we can't zoom that far in anyway with my camera. Okay, so that top flesh tone has got a lot of white in it. And it's kind of a little bit, actually it's not too far off. Instinct would be to add just a little bit of more blue. Okay. Now I'm going to paint the hair back over top of. Uh, this. In fact, I need to go to a much smaller brush. <laughs> Trying to do okay. So let's uh, let's go to a much smaller brush here. So now what I want to do is I'm going to just kind of up this with a bit more uh, warm kind of orangey qualities. bit more of a peachy kind of thing going. Just take a bit more white. Now, I don't know, on camera that looks, I don't know, it looks to me a bit more orangey. This is much more kind of fleshy, pinky kind of thing going on here, so, but we'll see. this you know I don't have a lot of room to maneuver in this painting it's kind of a tiny little space so I'm just going to take a bit of, remember this dark color that we mixed earlier? I'm going to take that, oops, where am I here? So this is the dark color, the same dark color I used to do all of my lines there initially. Right? It's, it's basically my warm red, cool blue, and cool yellow. Right, so it's got it when I put a little bit less ye cool yellow in it, so that's why it's got a tiny bit of a purplish kind of quality. And I'm just gonna mix some of these colors in here.
Um, maybe one of the things I just want to, I don't want to disregard is since I'm using these same colors, before I go too far down the rabbit hole here, I'm just going to take some of my flesh tone and paint it on this hand. So that at least they're they're matching, right? So that we don't have one color for the face and then a whole other completely different color on another part of the human body. All right again, I'm not sure how that looks. It looks a little yellow on camera. It's a little still a bit more pink, but okay. So next what I want to do is I want to start painting some of the, the lines back onto the face. So here's was our, our dark color we made before. I'm just going to bring it back over to my, where my flesh tones are. Just because I want to kind of reintegrate it back into some of these colors. So because I, I don't want it to be totally an intense color all by itself. So. I want to res I want to build back up to that darker area. So I'm just mixing it in with a bit of um, this flesh tone, and I'm gonna kind of just lightly paint some of these eyebrows. I'm just going to take that same color and just do a little bit in the hair. That's too, a little bit too light, but anyway, that's okay. Now I'm going to take the same color again. And I'm going to use it a little bit more with, with less or, or, or no um, modification with any other color. So it's going to be much more intense. All right, keep in mind, like that's the size of my fingernail. This whole part of the painting is the size of a fingernail. Right, this face. So it's don't have a lot of room to work on right here. get sort of the, the shape of this face in here. Okay, now I want to take a bit of take a bit of um, warm red. Just mix it a bit back into my flesh tone. It's not pure pure warm red. I'm gonna take that
I have to be kind of careful about going too far with this red, otherwise this figure will become more and more feminine really quickly. Okay. Now I will glaze over that the, the cheeks and get them a little bit more rosy as we go here. I take my dark color again. Actually, I'm just going to dilute. So, again, I don't want to go too wild with this dark color. So, I just want to mix it in with something just a little bit lighter. Let's get a bit more of slightly more pink. under his eyes, right? Okay. I think I'll leave that for right now. We'll... we'll or maybe should we get a little bit of the hair in, maybe? Yeah, maybe let's just quickly do a little bit of the hair. I kind of like, actually, this color that I just mixed. So I'm going to use that. white in here, but that's okay. Obviously it needs to be much darker because we want it to really pop away from the background. But I think for at this exact moment it's probably okay. So think about I'll probably do some of these details there uh, in a bit so let's tackle the clothing here I think we've got a bit of this warm blue in the cold blue which was which would make it a bit more of a um, like a cobalt blue. So just a little bit of that warm blue in there. I think that's really good actually. So. Right, still looks like just glowing um, cool color, but we've got some, uh, actually, you know what? I'm just going to take this color now and I'm just going to brush it over more of the body. 
So again, this is cool blue and and just a little, like maybe 80% cool blue, 10% or so warm being pretty aggressive with this. I, I, it's kind of obliterating some of the work I did earlier. Um, I mean, not not too too bad. At least for this stage. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of white that's going to go back into into here. But so basically, what I'm I put in is not the darkest color, but what I'm always looking for is my what we call the local color. Right, the local color is, you know, again, if people were to say, oh, it's the blue boy. Well, what is the, the, the dominant blue? Like, what blue actually is that? Oops. Hmm. Darker color eventually. clean a few of these brushes. A little bit of water splattered on there. I'm going to catch that. Okay, there's another little bit. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly blow dry this and then I'm gonna start painting some pretty brushy uh, uh, marks for the, the the all the wrinkles in this fabric. Like it's got a kind of a satiny kind of quality.
Okay. So I'm gonna take some white here. I don't mind. There's a little bit of yellow on there. That's okay. I don't need to be perfect white. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take the same mixture of cool blue and and uh, warm blue together. Let's get that. I'm just going to put this here, and then I'm, as I go, I'm going to dip into it. So there's a lot of different ways to go about what we're about to do here. You know, if we were talking to Gainsborough's rival, Joshua Reynolds, he would say you do this in like dozens and dozens of layers and blend it out softly. I'm going to try to avoid using my blending brush and simply use different, almost kind of an impressionist way of approaching this, letting all of the brush strokes stay. Now the, the, the fewer steps you put in between white and blue, the more visible those brush strokes are going to be, right? And if you're thinking of an impressionist, you, the, you use fewer and fewer steps, so those brush strokes really stand out from one another. Gainsborough is, you know, 100 and 200 years before the Impressionist, so he doesn't, he's not quite there yet, but he's much, you know, much more audacious with his brush uh, uh, technique than, than really any of his other contemporaries, at least in England. Um, okay, so... I'm going to add a bit of glazing fluid here. So let's zip back down. Okay, so here's my, my color. Let's get into here with glazing fluid. really know exactly what we have until we start painting with it and then we can we'll, we'll take it from there when we get there right so let's just we'll just work our way from the top down got this kind of jacket here, right? So this is where some of these ruffles are kind of little dots. I think we'll, we'll paint this a little bit, some white later on. Uh, just to get that started. If, you know, I all, I'm kind of tempted to, to brush that in. This whole area right here at the top of his chest. I think that's what I mean. I was going to go right into the smaller brush, but I think lightening this up makes most sense. So you get even more white on here.
So I want to start with sort of these bigger shapes. I'll just keep on going here. I think I might have to blow dry this because you know once you get a little bit of glazing fluid on there and then you try to paint over glazing fluid before it's dry it's just like it just actually sort of wipes away the work you've done so we'll blow So I'm not gonna, I don't really remember where all these lines are. I'm just going to do my best to try to get them in here.
So the, the more closely I observe all of this, just like in, in any aspect of, of art, the better it's going to, to turn out. And because I'm racing, you know, this might not turn out as, as well as I, I might like, but we just have to kind of keep in mind that, you know, it's, we can do the best. And it, we, you only can, you can only achieve so much when you're going really, really quickly. And also we don't have our, really our darkest colors in here yet either, right? So once we get a little bit more contrast in here, I think that will help a lot as well. So I just have, have to keep on having faith. Let's move down. So this, I, I'm not. Sure, I've got a big glob of paint here, which is. Um, I'm not exactly sure if this is white or glazing fluid, so we'll find out. As it dries. Okay, let's go to these legs. So we're gonna use the same color. Stockings. Looks like these are supposed to be a little bit more brown up there, so let's raise this up a bit higher and we'll come back and do that later. This is all in shadow, but I still want to have something here that I can darken. Those shoes are kind of like a brownish, a greenish brown. So I'm actually going to take this. Where's my yellow?
Actually, maybe with this color, I, I think I could get away with doing a little, um, just looking a little bit into this area around here. You know, just, just all this little grassy lines. I'm not going to spend anywhere near as much time as, as he might have, but... Just going to put a little bit in here so that it just suggests that there's... Some textures down under here. And again, remember that this painting is life-size, so each one of these marks, like a line like that, is about as long as the paintbrush that's in my hand <laughs> right now. All right, so just, if you're painting along with me and you're doing this, you're like, wow, look at all these details. How am I going to... You don't have to get them all in there, right? We're talking about some very tiny details, or big details for him, tiny details for us. Let's just um, hint at this rock right here. Actually, there's a bit of it's kind of a purple that he's painting, but uh, it won't hurt to oops, just describe. That's going to have to go much darker. Okay, let's just take a look and just see how we're doing. So, uh, pretty much everything needs to go darker except potentially the sky. You know, and it's, like I said, you know, sometimes it's good just to let things kind of sit and breathe, because now, now that I've got my, the, the blue boy himself starting to kind of appear in the center, this area in the sky that I was not too happy with, it now kind of, it's, it's within the ballpark for sure, if not... I mean, it's not exactly the same. Um, and if you kind of forgive this little area of that yellow over top, we're pretty close. Like, that is pretty close. I mean, I could see going, putting a little bit more blue back into the background here, and maybe just a little bit more of that brown, especially over some of this gray. But that's not how I felt before. Remember, I felt like I definitely needed it to go really much much more brown once we get this central figure all of a sudden that area come it sort of my view on it flips because it's very hard to see any single one part of the painting on its own without the rest of the painting around it sort of um uh influencing the way we see it Right? It's going to kind of filter in through our peripheral vision. Okay. I want to blow dry some things, but, uh, you know, one color I don't, I haven't really properly mixed yet is my black. And I think I, I, I really kind of need a black so that I can uh, do a little bit. I, so I want to start going into the shadows on the body, on the clothing. So to do that, we're going to... I think I've got enough. We'll see. So I'm going to take my warm red and my cool blue, and we're going to mix this together. It's 
So we mix all that cool blue together. And now we've got a purple, right? But it's a very muted purple because it's crossing very close to the neutral core, right? Add my cool yellow in there. And that's going to just pull this color closer and closer to that neutral core. It looks pretty good. Still a little bit on the blue side. Let's put a bit more warm red in there. There we go. That just basically killed off all color in here. So now we have just basically a very dark, dark gray. Not as black as we can possibly go, but probably darker than most people, um, than than you might probably need for most parts of the painting. Like really, the only places we're gonna use that color on its own would be the, the hat. In fact, we'll do that maybe next. A little bit of detailing in the eyes. And maybe on that foot. Beyond that, everything is gonna be mixed in with other colors, right? Uh, so speaking of the hat, let's just take this color and just go go wild with it and, and just put it right in place. Right, so still a little bit of level of transparency to it, which is totally fine and expected because, you know, I I don't want it to be super opaque until I'm done because I might want the, even the interior of that hat to get even darker. Uh, oh yeah, the, another reason why I wanted to mix this color is I want to take uh, a moment to, to sort of do a little bit of branches back here. And maybe, you know, I probably could have, could have, should have diluted this a little bit. So I'm actually just going to go back here. Let's take a bit of the white and turn this into a gray. It's a very dark gray. Otherwise, it's going to be, those lines in the background are going to be like, whoa, that's a little, we don't want to pull too much attention. Yeah, we're gonna just a little bit lighter. I, it's hard to really see what's going on here, so I'll just I'm just sort of playing a bit. I can't really see too much, which I think is the point, right? He's sort of deliberately obscuring, you know. And, and we can we'll glaze in here and darken it, and it'll all be kind of. I think I hear our neighbors outside running around and somebody fell. Our daughter's, oh, she just got up. <laughs> oh, excuse me, my goodness. Not sure I can fully grasp what's happening in these shadows, so I'm just gonna take a bit more.
blue. Mix it into here so it's not totally dark. But uh, I think this is some sort of like... You tell me what you see over here. I don't know if it's a shoreline or something going on over here. But again, it's, I don't think it's important that we know exactly what's happening there. And then I'm just going to take also the same blue that I just used here and just kind of go, in fact, let's zoom in and just so you can see, because he's done a lot of really beautiful, I mean, um, Gainsborough wanted it, at the end of the day just to paint landscapes. So he spent, he was one of the great landscape painters as well. Um, so I'm not going to, I don't have time to kind of, it's a whole other episode. Um, I just want to quickly, I mean, really quickly here, <laughs> create some shadow on these trees, and maybe I'll come back and lighten that up shortly. Do little highlights on top of it. These are intended to be kind of like the shadowy parts underneath um, the main body, the foliage of these trees. And I'm going to put some of this on the ground here as well. Not going to spend much time at all on that. Okay. Now I, I probably will come back to, and even use this very similar color in some of the the darker areas of the clothing. Um, but I won't go there quite just yet. Let's take again. We have a little bit of this warm blue let's just do it right down here so take this warm blue cool blue we have the same mixture here and even that warm blue just on its own is it sort of darkens that color maybe enough for our first little pass at some uh, shadow on on the, the clothing here so let's just see because we don't need to go right to the darkest area if we don't need to immediately here. Mm. That's what I had, some glazing fluid. That's, I don't want this to be so opaque and the glazing fluid also will make it a little bit more brushable. That way I can kind of blend these out. Just sort of go over the lines just a little bit, right? This is sort of my transitional color.
Okay, let's come down to the pants. So the next layer, I think we'll see a little bit more um, more of a change. You I mean you could see I mean obviously I want to try to be wrapping up here in about 45 minutes so I'm not gonna go too much further down this particular pathway I do want to just a little bit more I don't even know if that's in the original or not. <laughs> I just feel like that area just is a little bit empty and there would be a little more tension on the jacket there okay I get yeah it's not really there <laughs> but I'm putting it there anyway because I felt like my drawing my painting needed it and I just I'm just coming back in with a little bit of the light because it's I can kind of do a little bit of of wet on wet painting here while I've got that glazing fluid on there so I'm just taking advantage of that okay oh did I, on the socks did I want to do mm, I think the socks we're going to use a different color rather than just blue I think that's kind of blue enough for these socks Okay, so let's go to the next level here. Let's take this same color, got glazing fluid, and now I'm going to take my dark color and start kind of mixing it into here where we start getting a bit more of a, a little bit of a dark. In fact, I might as well just, let's just go a little bit more into the dark colors and Stop pussyfooting around. We got to get this painting done, Michael. Let's just amp it up. And so I think this area in the chest is still a little bit wet, which is fine. You know, I just said I kind of like that, but um, it might be a little, unless I want to use my blow dryer right now, which I, I just want to keep on moving. I'm going to paint this in here. Boom, we start getting some, now that that contrast starts coming in, all of a sudden, everything is gonna start making sense. Wow, that makes huge difference. And we'll, I'll pull out in a, in a second here so we can see how it starts affecting the full body. But just well we'll see maybe I don't know I'll just keep it like that let's do the other leg this 
shadow on the right part of the leg. And I'm just going to make, well, now that I'm painting over it, but I don't know I want to deal with this just in terms of my time. These, th This is like, I think the top of his socks or a ribbon that's tied around the, the pant legs. I'm not exactly sure. I've never quite worn pants like this before or outfit like that. Let's come back up here. Now this part, top part of his clothing should be you know, it's not totally dry, it didn't blow dry it, but it should be much less tacky than it once was. Still pretty tacky. My fingers are kind of sticking to it a bit. Again, my instinct is to really want to kind of soften up some of these edges. But when I think of of Gainsborough, it, we want to keep the the um, the brush strokes visible. And it's it's hard to do because and it, I, mean, I can see some people look at the original and think oh, I don't really see the as the brush strokes as visible as you're talking about. Again, we have to just remember that we're looking at the a painting which has been significantly reduced in scale from its original. Right? It's a full-sized painting, like life-size, huge canvas.
It's gonna leave a little sliver of light under in here a bit. Because even though it's gonna get really dark down here, I don't wanna get too dark. And I will be darkening this even more, but. Okay, just in terms of time, I think I'm just gonna leave that there like that. Let's go quickly over to, I, I should, I'm sort of going in the exact opposite direction. I should have probably started the top left corner of the painting so I don't have to reach across with my fingers. this train and move and let's do these shoes or the bows on the shoes with this color okay so let's just zoom back out again um Okay, getting there. I think while I'm right here, I'm just gonna darken this hat one more time. You know, I probably added a little bit too much white into some of those highlights just out of like going quickly. But I think what I want to do is do the hair. I'm actually, I'll probably blow dry this. I'll do the hair. Um, it's, well, I've got that brown. I might actually do a little bit of work down under here actually with a little bit of blue glaze down in here on the feet so there's still a little bit of work to do here folks Do the blue in the ground here really quickly. Okay. 
I'm gonna take, so I'm gonna use this um, cool yellow and cool blue. I made a green here before. And let's put a bit of glazing fluid in there. I wanna take this. into the this area right around the feet bit of this green all the way down here. I mean, I love doing th little things like that because it, it definitely, it it's something that when before I knew how to glaze, I would just try to mix a color like this. And it's like, what, how, like I would try to mix all of these layers of paint into one color. And it would just be like mind numbingly frustrating because you could never quite get it right. Now I really should be blow drying this because now I'm just sort of, I'm also kind of scraping, wiping some paint off. I just get very impatient. <laughs> and I think while I'm right here, I want to take is blue with some a darker color. So we just want to Right now it's it's very visible because it's all wet. I think when it dries it'll be much more subtle. area I also just want to darken that as well so I'm just going to take my dark color and my my brown so now that's a very dark color but I'm going to glaze with it so it doesn't get too like I just want to paint over everything but I'm just going to use this to continue darkening in this area 
behind the boy here. even take it just darken that whole area let's do the same thing Just use it to shape these calves a little bit. I think we'll darken that again. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to use that same color that I've just done a whole bunch of this with on the clothing and significantly darken that. In fact, Maybe I'll do that right now before I blow dry. So I'm going to take this color, make sure I have a fairly significant amount of glazing fluid on my brush. Glazing fluid dominant. Oops, I got a bit of red on there. Can I live with that? I think I can. Let's, uh... Cutting some of the intensity of those whites down. Leaf should be white. I should whiten that up a bit. But you can see how it's all of a sudden, you know, putting a little bit of this around just starts having quite the effect, right? Um, even on the face, I think. Let's do that and then I'm going to blow dry it.
think what I gotta do is get a lot more um, put a little blush on the cheeks there before I go too much darker maybe though before I blow dry I'm just gonna take the my dark color not my, the full intensity of it but pretty you know it's diluted a little bit and just get some hair in excuse me So I think I'll leave that alone for a moment. Okay. Maybe I'll take a little, just before I blow dry, let's just take some of the darker color right in these eyes. Just darken that real quick. Yikes. So I'm going to blow dry things here.
Okay, I see Tanya and Lolly just tuning in. Good to see again some familiar faces. Her names. <laughs> um, let's just take a look and see where we where we're at. Side by side here as we get. Obviously, there's still more work to be done, but we're getting into the ballpark, right? I, I want to continue doing darkening. Uh, significantly some of these areas on the body um, we could again keep on darkening down in the trees in fact I could could be another brown or a little bit of blue I don't know how much work I want to do do there at this point um, oh and the shoes let's maybe just take a moment to do some work down there bring those back out okay Let's go right into the dark right here. I'm just gonna darken that. I was gonna kind of glaze, and yeah, it's like you know what? Let's just try to get this painting done. Put a bit of a highlight on that toe, otherwise it's going to look quite flat. Actually, little bits of highlights on both of those feet. Um, I think I'm just going to quickly work on this. Uh, I'm going to take a bit of. Uh, I'm going to take mix this a, a cool blue and cool red, make a bit of a purple. some glazing fluid. Some of these rocks right here. Funny to think of how different this painting would be if there was this, if he had left this big sheepdog in this particular part of the painting. I wonder if that would have made it even more endearing to people, or if it would have been made it really silly and cartoony. And I 
I mean, I think that's why he took it out, is he felt it was... I, I, I remember reading a quote somewhere about that, where he just felt it was, like, a, you know, just a little much. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, that's kind of silly. Let's get a bit of... A little bit of green... Where's my cool yellow? So just these little hints spend too much time down here but I just there's a lot of and there's a lot of space beyond the figure right and I don't want to just have you know a figure floating in space I want to kind of just be able to articulate a little bit of what's going on around him oops that was a big Some of this is going to disappear as the paint dries, but just that little subtle bit of kind of grassiness. It's helpful. Do we want to put any? I think there's. Let's. I want to put a tiny bit of a highlight with this kind of green back into these trees here. Okay, I think I think that's everything I want to do for the uh, the background, you know, officially. Sorry, I'm just there's a this somehow I think I don't know where is that. Come on, get on camera. Where are you going? How many brushes I gotta push out of the way to get there? It's just a little bit of pain, of something. Either it's stuck to my finger, it's stuck on here, or I pulled this off at one point, so I just wanna So I think I will Thank you. 
Just want to give a little bit of definition. Okay, let's do the feathers in that hat. Feathers are kind of like a brown, very light brown. In fact, I'm just gonna, just gonna take glazing fluid, a little bit of brown. Let's see how much we can get away with. Maybe I'll just lighten that. Yeah, let's get a little bit of a lighter brown. I'm not sure, we'll see how well this works. Well, he says, uh, um, enjoying watching this process. It's my relaxation therapy. And Tony says, I 1,000% agree with you on that. <laughs> I appreciate that, guys. Uh, that's pretty funny. Okay, so we're going to look at this feather. So... I'm just gonna launch right into here with some brown. Oops. <laughs> hmm, I think I'm gonna need to mix a bit of white in here. Do I have any white on the palette left? Perfect, like bright, bright, bright white. That's a little intense. to kind of bring that back because it got a little bit lost in terms of its shape. I'm not even sure that's exactly the right shape. While I'm right here, I'm just going to, I want to take a bit of this white and put it, oops, make a little bit of a gray. So, 
so that uh, it's not clear in his painting, but it looks to me like there's, you know, we have, let's, oops, I'm going to have to come and fix that, but we've got kind of like the top part of a hat. Massage this a little bit, but ay, ay, ay. So I might, I can glaze over that to darken all of this as much as I want, I just... I'm always, I always sort of err on the side of a little bit of clarity, if possible. You know, I think that's part of the job as a painter is to, I think, is to try to avoid as much kind of confusion as possible unless you're doing it deliberately for various different kinds of reasons right I just want somebody to look at it's like what is that in his hand is that a textbook or oh it's a hat oh see I didn't under see that's I don't want that kind of reaction um, okay let's get Let's get this brown back in here. Just a little bit of white. <laughs> uh, is that dry enough? Marauder six six seven says you should use a feather brush to paint the fre paint the feather. <laughs> Got some jokers here. Hmm, you know what? I'm just gonna go over this with this color. color actually and it makes me want to add a bit of it like on the... see I'm a little bit you could see where I just painted 
these blue just out of for time's sake, which now I feel like maybe I should bring a bit of this back. Maybe while I'm waiting for a few things to dry, you know, I could blow dry, but let's just, I want to keep some momentum going. I'm going to come back up to the top and maybe just do a little bit of detailing. I'm just going to kind of invent a little bit here with these buttons. I'm just going to reduce the number of buttons. take uh, just a little mute this a little bit Trying to give it the look of the fabric and kind of rippling and wrinkling a little bit. Right, keep in mind, each of these little dots that I'm doing in the actual painting would be about the size of the button on your pair of jeans, right? This painting is this is life size in its original state. And the canvas I'm painting on is a nine by 12. Right, so we're of vastly different scales here.
So I'm just trying to avoid doing a, a straight line as I come down. I'm not even really, I haven't looked at the original. So I'm just I'm like, oh, I think this is from what it looks like. Oh yeah, I kinda, that's not too far off as I look up for the first time. Oops. I mean, as I'm doing this, I am I am just barely touching the surface of this canvas, right? I added a little bit of that on the other side, even though I couldn't see it in the painting. Because I always remember, like, it doesn't matter what the original looks like at, at to, after a certain point. Like, it's what does your painting look like? And if it's, if people look at me like, oh, it looks like you missed something on the other side. You're like, oh, no, 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 it's not there in the original. I'm like, ah, oh, uh-huh. Yeah, well, it still looks a little funny. Right? I don't want that. I want it to, to just sort of people not to have to even think about the little details like that. Put on the bottom of the jacket. paint this in here but we'll glaze over top of it so it'll kind of disappear but we'll still see a bit of it so that we know it's there do we have any of this oh we got little bits on the shoes as well here <laughs> okay, uh, let's so uh, let's do the the feather now. <laughs> um, you guys are very sweet. All these comments in there. 
Uh, okay. Um, let's take some of this darker brown. Just get a bit of white. Oops, sorry. Just realized it wasn't on camera there. I'm going to put a bit of glazing fluid in there. <laughs> One drop. And how we do this? Um, looks like we're kind of curving up. Maybe I'll draw the spine of the feather in. okay I guess but not my best work here but the painting's not over right so So do that. I'll let that dry for a moment. While that's drying, I'm just going to come back up into this hat. Well, let me just think, like, let's say if I was to try to finish it off in the next, like, ten minutes, what should I do here? Because i got to get our daughter bathed, oops, pretty soon here. Oh, I'm going to put a little blush. Okay, so let me see. The things that I want to do, uh, blush on the cheeks, that's important because he's got quite rosy cheeks. Um, I want to add a little bit more, more darkness in the clothing. To touch that hand up ever so slightly. A little bit more brown, like darkening all of this here. Do that a little bit more there. We're pretty close. We're get, getting there. Getting, getting very close. So... I think I need just to blow dry everything. Just, um, well, maybe let's, we could do the, I don't think I've touched the face in a while, so I could do a little rosy cheeks first and then I'll blow dry. Um, so let's, I'm gonna take, my red here, I don't got a lot of room, but we don't need much. I'm just gonna take a little drop of glazing fluid here. That's how little we need of everything, right? Just to see. Okay, it's going to be very subtle, but that's what we want, right? Okay. I think my brush was a little, as I was mixing, I'm like, I think this brush is a little bit wet. So let's 
do this again. I'm just going to add a little bit more red. Ooh, I don't know. That might be too much. Oops. Sorry, where is it? There we are. Okay. So take our glazing fluid. Get more on there. We can always brush it away if it's too much. I think I need just a tad of white in here. There, you can see it now kind of appearing. Ah, I gotta blow dry all this. This is, um, yeah. Okay, so let's just take a moment, and blow dry things. I need to even get a little bit more rouge on that face there. Okay, just gotta make sure that brush nice and dry.
Man, that is tricky. Getting into those details, boy, oh boy. Well, I think I'm just gonna move on here. much Feels like a, a you know fine watchmaking kind of very intricate tiny little detail of work here. Um, okay, I think the rest of that can be done with glazes just to kind of darken it down. It looks more rougey and in, in, I think on my side of things than it might otherwise. So now. Yeah, I was gonna blow dry all of this, so let's do just that. Did I do that recently? I can't remember. So I just want to now, I think just finishing touches, just darkening a little bit with some um, glazing fluid. So I'll just use this big patch of dark, kind of, I'm not sure, even sure, oh, where did that go? Ooh. Dripping glazing fluid all over the place. Let's take a smaller brush. That's a bit too much. Hmm, look at the hair just kept getting bigger and bigger on that head. Ah, 
Okay, well, it is what it is, right? I mean, I obviously I would take my sweet time doing this otherwise, but just in the interest of finishing up as quickly as possible. So it's all pushing the, these darker colors more and more and more. Sorry, big head in the way again. Um... I don't know 
let me just think uh, about how that looks. that really quickly. gonna blow dry and I think I do want to just darken ever so slightly with a little bit of glaze on the on the, f the face and then put a little pop of light for the eyes where the reflection on the eyes are Pretty intense, that's pretty dark. So just take it and just see. Might be good enough. That might be a little intense, but
Okay, I just want to get... I need to mix just a little bit more of a flesh tone again here. difference a little bit of light just makes me make a little pop like that So obviously there's some differences. I could continue darkening and darkening and darkening and darkening, but um, you know how much you know at some point. Like I mean, here I just want to do a little speed. Right. We'll just darken a little bit. I can't help it. Um, Mostly just because the majority of time, like, especially like my students, where whenever I'm teaching, often a lot of them will really neglect to go dark. So that's why I'm always a little bit loath just to kind of just end before I'm gone 
really as dark as I could go, but I think a painting like this, we need the more and more contrast, the better it'll get. <laughs> And then at a certain point you're also like, but I also gotta live a, my life. <laughs> so, oops, I'm gonna keep that on there. I think that's good. Pretty, pretty good. Good enough for government work, as my grandfather used to say. Uh, right? Or do I need to do just a tad more down here? Yeah, okay. Gotta just walk away at some point. Um, okay, I'm I'm pretty happy with the way that looks. Let me see. Feels like the, like a long time since the last time we did one of these paintings. Um. And here we go. Paul says, I have a blue girl. <laughs> You're right, I got a blue girl. Um, wow, cool. Great. Thanks for all the comments in the chat there, everybody. Okay. So please like, subscribe to the channel. If you want to contribute to the show, if you feel it was worth a buck, you can certainly leave a dollar. Uh, by using the PayPal description, you could send a check or e-transfer by contacting me through the Facebook or my website. All those links are down in the description below. On Tuesday, we're going to continue on our beginner's uh, journey through the acrylic palette and understanding how these colors work. So if you're like, whoa, this is way over my head, don't worry, don't worry. On Tuesdays for the next few months, we're painting very simple, simple paintings. And on Thursdays, we're painting a little bit more advanced paintings. I believe next Thursday, we're going to be painting a painting by Roy Lichtenstein, the famous pop artist. And we're going to be beginning the countdown to the most expensive painting of all time. And so I think we're Roy Lichtenstein's painting is number 40, I think. And we're talking a painting about a painting that sold for over a hundred and twenty million dollars. <laughs> so, hundred and twenty million dollars is where we're starting, and we're going to get more and more expensive as we go, so beginning on Thursday. So, there's we need some very famous paintings over the course of the next little while. We're going to be touching on all these artists that we haven't gotten to lately, like Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, M Amadeo Mondigliani. Um, I'm not even sure so many of them. Uh, Paula says, what happened to the Apple Pay? It disappeared. I don't think I've had an Apple Pay. Uh, there's the Super Chat function here in YouTube, which you can use as well. Um, okay, 
Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening, morning, wherever you are on planet Earth. We'll see you guys in a couple of days. And until then, upload your version of this, and then we're going to get together and look at all the incredible work you've done over the course of the next couple weeks. Not sure when that'll be, but we'll see you soon, everybody. Good night. <laughs>